Okay, well here we are. This is uh, Sukkot 2014, and we're someplace in Florida, as far as I know. And um, for those of you who've been taking Hebrew and coming every morning to class, I hope you feel like you got a lot out of that. Yes. And that uh, you can go home and read more and dig in your Bible. So what I want to do today is just show you a bunch of things. Um, probably some of them you have seen, maybe some of them you haven't seen, that are um, embedded in the text. And just inspire you to know that uh, God is in this book because you're going to see things that are going to go like, how could that get there? And um, to know that, uh, to encourage you to study more and get more out of your um, Hebrew studies. So um, we're just going to look at one verse, Genesis 1-1, maybe arguably the most important verse in the whole book. And so what is the first letter of the first part? What is the first word in Hebrew? Bereshit. And what is the first letter? Bet. Bet. But Bet is the second letter of the alphabet. And I think maybe by logic we think, well, it should have been the Aleph, right? Why didn't God start with the first letter of the, of the Aleph Bet? So um, maybe you know, you probably have heard the teaching. What is the, uh, the Bet, the root meaning for the letter Bet? House. And so, of course, that's how we look at it. Oh, God had a house in mind for us from the very beginning. And, um, and that's a great idea, and it's not a wrong idea, but it's a sort of Christian idea, because the Jews don't think about that. Okay, I'm going to tell you what they think about. So, uh, all the letters of the Aleph Bet heard that God was going to give the Torah to his people, and they all came running because they all wanted to be the first letter. And so the last letter, the Tav, got to God first and said, I want to be the first letter. I'm really important. And God looked at the Tav and he said, well, you know, you're the last letter of Mavet, which is death. And I, I just can't start the Bible with something that represents death. So then the one before the Shin came running. Oh, oh, I think I should be the first letter. God looked at the Shin and he said, well, you're the first letter of Shachat, which means to destroy or to kill. He said, I can't have you be the first letter. And so they're on and on they go and finally get to the bed, almost to the beginning. And the bed came and said, I'm the first letter in the word Baruch, you know, blessed. And God said, you're right, you can be the first letter. And the Aleph said, what? I'm the first letter. I should be the first letter. And God said, I'm going to save you for something special. I'm going to save you for the first letter of the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, Anuchi, Yahweh, Elohecha, I am Yahweh, your God. So that became the position of the Aleph. But you notice, and we were talking about this um, before we started, that almost in every case, the Aleph son, who should get the, the blessing and the inheritance, doesn't get it, right? It's always at least the second, maybe sometimes the fourth, right? So, uh, there is a house. Um, now, somebody, uh, during the time of the Masoretic text, decided that there would be a shva here instead of a pata. And it makes a difference in the grammar, because when there's a shva, it means not in the beginning, but in a beginning. Dum, da -dum, dum. <laughs> But the rabbis have an answer for this, too. So you see the shape of the bet, right? This part is closed. So whatever happened before the bet is none of your business. <laughs> Everything goes from here forward. And that's what we need to know about. Okay? All those other arguments um, are just talking air. Okay? The important thing is, from, from your... Uh, from the beginning of your universe, the universe that we live in, that God created from the beginning. Okay? So, that is the story of the Bet. The Bet is um, in the Torah scroll and in the books that carry the marks of the Torah scroll. It's enlarged, it's a big letter. Um, it's a first letter, it's important. And, you know, we have some of the same thing in English. It's called a, uh, I think it's called a drop cap or something like that. Well, you'll see the first letter big and 
in some books, um, maybe ornamented like that, because, just because it's the first letter. So it's not an unusual idea. Uh, there is a house, and uh, God has a house, because he said um, in Exodus, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. And God is wanting to dwell among us, okay? All right, let's see, we're gonna put some more letters up here. <coughs> so if you've been learning, maybe you can remember what this means. It has no vowels, duh. Head, right, head. Okay, so um, so God had an idea in His mind. It was in His head where everything started, right? And then um, uh, what does it say? Uh, the evidence of things unseen, right? So things have, are existing, and God Himself is eternally existent, and so His ideas. But when when do we see His ideas come forth? When He speaks and then he speaks these things into existence. The next two letters and, and lots of people have taught about developing the root meanings of each letter and how that all goes together. I'm not going to do that. I'm not a paleo expert. So now, the Rosh has come to the first word, which is Rashit. Okay? Rashit is translated as a beginning. It carries the idea with it of um, strength and might. We also talked about the fact that uh, in the ancient texts, all the letters run together, so we don't even know where the end of a word is and where the beginning of a word is and how things can, um, can be broken up differently because of the way the language is. So actually, these two letters, the Yud and the Ta, are a prefix for an idea of a verb of doing something unto yourself. So the next word is bara, and that is the word created. But if I divided it here instead of here, it would still have a logical meaning in Hebrew, and that would be in, here's the head and the mind, he created for himself. He created something for himself. Okay? So that's a possibility. God created things for himself. Now one thing that, um, that the rabbis are really big on is the anagrams. Um, we could divide, now you notice, right, these three letters and these three letters are the same, okay? Um, so that's kind of interesting. We could actually divide this word here instead of here and here and there, okay? If I divide it here, then I have bara, he created, and then I have this word, sheet. It is not the sheet on your bed, okay? It comes from a root of, um, to set something in place, okay? And I'll give you two examples of the root where it's used. It's used in Seth's name, okay? His name is Shet. And uh, remember, the two brothers got a scuffle, somebody died, and then Eve had another son, and his name was Shet. And it said, she says, because God has appointed me, I think is how it's translated, appointed me another son. But God had to set something in place, because already the first son had screwed up, the second guy was dead, and now who's going to carry the line of Messiah? So we see this appointing, okay? Another place this root is used is in um, the Psalms, where it says, if the foundations be destroyed... 
What can the righteous do? And this is the word foundation. So uh, he created a foundation. He created a foundation. There's, um, I don't know, probably 20 anagrams of the six letters all together. And uh, I will just tell you some of them. Uh, it, it can be rearranged to say, B'tishrei Aleph, B'tishrei Aleph, which is on the first day of Tishrei, which is the rabbis believe that uh, what we celebrate as Yom Truah is a new year. It came to be the new year. They believe it was the creation of the world that day. It happened in the beginning, B'tishrei Aleph, the same letters rearranged. You can also see in here, you can rearrange the letters of Reishi to make She'arit, which is the remnant. So what's in the beginning? The remnant is from the beginning. And where is everything going? It will be held together by the remnant in the end. You can see in here, we learned the word Brit. Do you remember what the word Brit is? Covenant. Covenant. And Esh is fire. Right? There is a covenant of fire from the beginning. Right? This is how the rabbis look at this. Right? You know there is a place where it calls, uh, in Deuteronomy, it calls uh, Moses talking about the Torah, and he says it's a, it's a fiery law. Okay? Because it'll burn the tar out of you. Right? If you don't do it, it'll certainly burn the tar out of you. And if you do do it, it'll burn the tar out of you. Either way. It'll burn the tar out of you, right? There's stuff we need to get rid of in life. Uh, we can also see, uh, if we take this Rosh, then what's left? The Bayit, right? The Rosh and the Bayit, the head of the house. All this is in the idea of in the beginning, okay? Here's another one. You can see Yar and Shabbat. He foresaw the Sabbath even from the beginning. All that is just in these letters, okay? So I think that's pretty cool. Now we're gonna talk about the verb create. Now the question is, did God create something from nothing or not? And this is a long-term argument. Uh, fancy name is ex nihilo, from nothing. And part of the idea of that comes from this bar right here. which is sometimes translated as purity. Now, if you go to um, Psalm 2, it's translated in most of your Christian Bibles, kiss the son lest he be angry. Okay, I can assure you that no rabbi will ever translate that, kiss the son, because that doesn't mean, I mean S-O-N, right? Like the bar in bar mitzvah, right? Um, there are about two other places. Um, the word bar is actually Aramaic. So uh, we don't see it much in the Torah. You see it in Ezra and Nehemiah where there starts to be sprinkled. Um, Daniel sprinkled Aramaic throughout the text. But this is much earlier than that. There are a couple of places where bar does mean son in uh, Proverbs. But generally, it has the idea of purity associated with it. So we take that and we say, well, this verb means to create out of nothing. And um, I, I can prove, actually, that that's not true. There was an evolutionist, and he was studying. He's studying all the chemical formulas for creation and how things go together in DNA sequences. He studied for years. And he decided he was going to challenge God to a duel. He said, God, you make something, I can make it. I can do whatever you do, I can do it. So God's, you know, God is never threatened <laughs> by the things we think we can do without him. He says, okay. So God reaches down, gets some dirt off the ground. And this golden, turquoise, beautiful bird with the most beautiful song you ever heard, just goes flying off so gracefully. The evolutionist looks at it for a little while. He says, okay, he's got all the formulas in his mind. And he reaches down and God says, get your own dirt. <laughs> okay? Everything came from somewhere. 
Now, I will tell you this. We learned that the definite article in Hebrew is the he, but in Aramaic, it happens to be the aleph at the end. So actually, in, if you're going to go to the Aramaic, you're going to have in the beginning, the sun. Very interesting. Well, there's more about that in a minute. Bara is conjugated for the third person singular. He did something. So that's going to be critical in a second. Now you learned enough to know about the ending. You can, can you read this word even though it has no vowels? Don't cry. Elohim. Elohim. And what does the ending tell you about it? Plural. That it's plural. So Elohim does not just only mean our God and Yahweh, that, the God we refer to. It has a, uh, it can mean, it's translated judges in some places, or I think mighty ones, PJ has said several times. So, but the point is, this is a plural noun. And this is a singular verb. Okay, so the concept here is the one true God. One God is doing something. Okay, and uh, the verbs, the verb system in Hebrew is the most complex thing about Hebrew. And it's very, very specific. You always know who it's talking about. And uh, the tense of the verb, you can always see it. So plural and singular. Now we will learn the Aleph Tav. Okay, so the next word is the Aleph Tav. So what is Aleph? A. A. A is the first letter. What is Tav? The last letter. Okay. Um, and we learned, no, did we learn that here? I can't remember. Uh, there is a grammatical use for it, and it means it's the direct object marker. In other words, the uh, order of the words in a Hebrew sentence is kind of flexible, and if you're trying to figure out who did what to whom, the olive tab will help you figure that out. Okay, because we're going to find out now what did Elohim create? What did he create? Uh, I think you can be pretty sure in Revelation when Yeshua shows up and he says, I am the Alpha and Omega, that's probably not what he said. Right? What are Alpha and Omega? Greek. Greek, and they are the first and last letters of their alphabet. Um, so it's comparable to this. I think probably he said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. Now when we say Aleph and Tav, it kind of has a meaning of um, like A to Z or soup to nuts, or from here to there. So when we say Aleph Tav, the whole alphabet is implied, all the letters. So um, Moisha, Moisha Mendel had to go to the next town. It was a long trip. He was going to have to walk, and he's walking, and, you know, and it gets to be time for the morning prayers, and he starts to, oi. I forgot my Siddur. The Siddur is the prayer book. God, you know I'm not a very smart man. I don't know all the prayers. How can I pray? I don't have my prayer book. Oy, what am I going to do? He says, God, I do know the Aleph bet. I'm just going to say the letters to you one at a time. And you arrange them. You make them into the prayers. Okay? Okay? This is the idea. So, in the beginning, all the letters, right? What does it say? That by the word of God, right, where the foundations of the earth were laid. So this implies that all the letters are there. Of course, it also implies that Yeshua was there because he is the Aleph in the top. What does it say? In the beginning was the, what word was it? It was all these letters, right? That's all we have to make words is all these letters. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of other things inside the meaning of the Aleph Tav. I'm going to tell you one because um, cause you mentioned the plow this morning, okay? The tree, right? 
So we already we, we talked about the um, the ancient uh, uh, symbol for the olive, right? And and that's the ox, right? It's the ox. And then we talked about the symbol for the top, which is this. The word Aleph Tav can mean a plow. It can mean a plow. It appears in, um, and they shall uh, make their plowshares, balloon into plowshares and whatever, how that goes. All right, I, c I could tell you in Hebrew if that would help. They <laughs> shall beat their plowshares into swords. Uh, and their spears into pruning, pruning hooks. You know, it goes both ways. There's two scriptures where they're making the peaceful things out of war, but then there's another one where they're taking the war things. Did I set that backwards? Peaceful things and making it into war. Into war. That happens war, once. War. But twice, they take the war things and they beat them into farming tools. Okay? Well, this is so cool. What are we talking about? We're talking about a plow. Here's an ox. Right? Here comes the ox. And look, this is the plow. It actually looks like this, the oldest form of plow. It looks like this. The man's standing here holding this, and this is turning up the dirt down here. And where's the ox? He's right here. He's pulling the whole thing. You have a job to plow up the ground so that the seeds can be planted. In so ground. all the building blocks for life and everything are here in the Aleph Tav. Okay? It's never translated in your Bible. It's used thousands of times, thousands of times. It's a direct object marker. Every sentence, almost every sentence is going to have a direct object. Um, it has, there are some that, that stand by themselves, and this one stands by itself, and then we're going to see another one that's attached. The ones that stand by itself, um, it's very interesting if you count them specifically in the Westminster Leningrad Codex, blah, 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 there are 613 of them that stand by themselves. What did he create? Ha Shamayim. What's the Shamayim? Water. The heavens. The waters. The heavens. The heavens. Right? It is where the waters are, right? Because Sham, Sham up there, Mayim, that's where the water is. Or the water used to be. What happened? <laughs> right, we talked about this. Shamayim is dual. There are two of them. Right, Mayim is dual, there are two of them, the water is above, and the water is below, the water is above, that broke at Noah's flood. There are two heavens, the heaven where God lives, and the heaven that you can see. And the Vav means and, right, it's a nail, it's the thing that holds things together. And here comes another it, okay, here comes another direct object, but we already know that God created more than just the heavens, he created the heavens and the earth, right? We'll get to it in a second. The rabbis call this Vav the pillar of creation. I'm not sure uh, why, but it's very interesting that it's attached. So this is an example of an attached olive top. Okay, here comes the other thing that he created. They use colons for, for the period at the end of the sentence. Ha, ha, it's pronounced ha, it's right, ha, arts. He created the heavens and the earth, right? Okay, start counting, my friends. How many, how many words are there? That's easy. How many words? Words. Well, well it, the way it's written in the, in the text, right? Seven, ding, 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 okay? Is seven God's favorite number or what? It's a completeness, okay? All right, let's take a little longer. How many letters are there? How many letters? 
There are 22 letters in the alphabet. As a matter of fact, I'll give you a jump on it. This is the 22nd letter right here. Well, if you just count the letters straight up. How many you got by the end? There are 28. Oh. Right? I hope I'm not taxing anybody's morning Shabbat brain by doing one small multiplication uh, example, okay? 28 letters. Um, what is four? What is the number four? Four. Four corners of the earth. Very good, okay? So the four corners of the earth, the four winds, the four angels out of the four corners. Um, four is associated with a different kind of completion. It's, uh, we've described like every facet of something if we, do, if we get the four. Hmm? Fire, water, air, earth. Fire, uh, that's one uh, idea, right? Fire, water, air, earth. Okay, I'm not going to talk to you about Pardis today. You can make your own Pardis um, research. Uh, but what Pardis, when we cover Pardis, we cover the interpretation of the scripture according to the forefathers according to the hint, usually is about Yeshua, the personal devotional meaning for you, and then the future meaning. Okay, and that covers the meanings uh, for every scripture. Four. So we have uh, 28, 28 letters here. Now I'm going to tell you something totally absurd. I want to tell you, I did not um, figure about half of this out. Um, and I could never have figured this out. Some brilliant mathematician figured this out. Okay, we didn't talk about it much, but each letter has a value. Each letter has a value. So the aleph is one, and the bet is two. We get up to ten. The yud is ten, and then we count. We start with twenty, and blah blah blah. The biggest number you can write is tav, and it's four hundred. Okay. If you take the value of this letter times this letter times this letter times this letter times all those letters by each other times the number of the letters that we figured out was 28, you get a very big number. Okay? But then, if you add up each word, and you time this word times this word times this word times this word times, this word, times the number of words, which is seven. Okay, and you divide the one by the other. You know this? You divide the one number by the other. It's not to the correct power, but I'm gonna write some digits up here and watch you go, oh. I have a lot of digits. Right? The, de the decimal place doesn't come out in the right place. But this is pretty universally recognized. Right? Pi is actually 314159. Uh, okay? When I went to school, we use uh, 22 sevenths, if you can remember that. And that's uh, 3142. This is infinite. What is this doing here? Can anybody explain to me what pi is doing in Genesis 1 1? It's an amazing thing. Pi, pi is actually hidden in another place um, in the Bible. And this, and this is a little bit interesting. We'll just take a, a little side tour here. Uh, when Solomon is uh, building the labor, and it talks about a measuring line, okay? A measuring line is spelled like this. It's pronounced kav. Okay, that's the measuring line. And it has a value of 106. There's another place uh, where it's even indicated in the text that it's a misspelling. They put an extra hay on it. So now it has a value of 111. Okay? And it says in uh, all the, uh, you know, the great... Uh, exposers of mistakes in the Bible say, look, it says that the diameter is 10 and the circumference is 30. 
oh, that's terrible math because a circumference has to be related to this somehow, right? But if you take that 30 and you multiply it times this and you divide it by this, you get a very accurate number, 314150 something. What does that second word mean? The, it, it, the when, when it's spelled like, it's the same word, and it's the same, and it's the same word. Um, and I think it appears like this in Chronicles when it's talking about Solomon building the labor, and it appears like this in 2 Kings. And uh, no, 2 Kings is this one, and the Chronicles is this one. And when you get to this one, when you're reading, it says, this is a mistake in spelling. Don't read the hey, it's a spelling mistake. But it had a purpose, and <laughs> it has an amazing uh, outcome on it. Okay. Now, there are uh, six olives, I think, right? Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five. There are six olives. Now, since we can only go, now, and let me say this about the value of the letters. They don't do math like this, okay? When you go to algebra class in Israel, they're going to use the same numbers that, that we use, okay? They're not trying to do math with these. Uh, but if you, if you buy a Bible in Israel, when you get to the chapter heading, chapter one is going to be a big olive, and chapter two is going to be a big bet. Um, so they still do use them in that for that. Now it is written that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And so the rabbis look at the six olives because they use the olive to be a thousand after they run out of all the other letters, right? They go back to olive. And they say this is the six thousand years is... Um, it's a prophetic picture of the 6,000 years of life on earth, right? And the seventh day is today. That's today. It's Shabbat. The seventh day is Shabbat. There's a, there's a concept of Yom Shekulo Shabbat, a day which is all Shabbat, their idea of what we would call the Millennial Kingdom. Okay? So they, they see that that would be coming. And what they say is, that there are uh, 2,000 years of no Torah. And 2,000 years of Torah. And 2,000 years of Messiah. Oops, now they're in trouble. And then the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. It's written in Talmud, it says, do not ever go and deliberately look in the text to find the time of the coming of Messiah. Because if you go and look for it, you will find that it has already come. Anybody but that guy, right? Anybody but that guy that came 2,000 years ago. Even though their own ideas show them that. Okay? They say, oh, the Messiah will come on the fourth day. Because of the things in creation. What was... Uh, what was uh, created on the fourth day? The stars. The stars, the moon, and the sun. The moon and the sun are in the sky at the same time on the fourth day. Therefore, Messiah will come on the fourth day. They just drag it all together, and that's the conclusion they come to. Well, I think he did come on the fourth day. Right? When, was, when about was the world created? About 4,000 B.C., right? Right as we get up to the end of the 4,000 year, here comes Yeshua, right on time. It's amazing how much they study, how much they can understand, uh, but when it comes to face-to-face -to -face with saying, this is the man, they're like, oh, but he didn't blah, 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 and he didn't exactly what Judas thought he was going to do. He didn't take over the government. Uh, we can see, actually, we can see the 7,000-year plan of God in these words. Mm -hmm. Good 
This is just a note to myself. Okay, who was the first guy? Adam. Adam. I'll write for you in English today, since it's Shabbat. We don't want to hurt ourselves. Okay, he was the first, to, how long did he live, do you remember? 930, I think, 930 years. He lived almost a thousand years, okay? He was the beginning. Okay? Um, he was, uh, this is sometimes translated as um, strength. I think I said that, right? He was really God's first son, right? I think that's scripture. And, um, and he lived almost the first thousand years. He was the beginning. Who's the next thousand years? You just missed him by a little bit. Do you, you have to look at that. I have a great chart. You can see it. Noah? Noah was the next, in the next millennium. Noah missed Adam by, I don't know, maybe 50 years. The flood, I think. I think in terms of, if I talk about AM, that's Anno Mundi, that's counting from the year one as one and counting forward, which is what the Jews do. Their um, calendar is currently 5775, that's, that's their year. So it's close to 6,000. Um, so Adam died in 930, and uh, Noah got on the boat, I think, the, what was the flood? Do you know Anamundi? You don't know Anamundi. Somewhere, I think he missed, uh, he missed um, Adam by about 50 years. All those other guys that were born between Adam and Noah, they knew Noah. Okay. All those other guys from Seth down were still alive when Noah got on that boat, except Noah's father who died. Oh, and Enoch. Right? <coughs> That's right. Methuselah. He was uh, about the sixth generation, seventh, I don't know, eighth. Okay. He was eighth generation, Methuselah. All right. But what happened in Noah's time? <coughs> there was another creation. I mean, everything had to be made new because so much violence that Hamas, we were talking about this morning, Hamas filled the earth. And so here it is. Here's a creation. Okay. Who's the next guy? of his generation? Abraham. Abraham. Do you know what year Abraham was born in if you count from the beginning of the world? Uh, no joke. BC? No, from counting from the beginning of the world. Oh. No way. Yes, way. Oh. The God is just so amazing. Right? He's just so good. Okay? Abraham was the friend of Elohim. Right? They had a, for the first time, they had an intimate relationship. And so here's the Elohim. He's the, the third millennium. Okay, so these are the two, uh, as the rabbis see it, no Torah gods, starting with Abraham. Uh, that's Torah. It says in Genesis uh, 26, 5, that Abraham kept all the statutes and laws and Torah of God. He was a faithful guy, and he obviously had some um, conversation <laughs> with this creator. All right. And then, as we said, at, on the fourth day, just as we're expecting, the Aleph Tav, here comes Yeshua. In his first coming. Okay? Now we're out of the Bible. Okay, and I'm going to write something. Please don't be offended by it. Uh, these are the 2,000 years of Torah. These are the two thousand, the two thousand, right? Two thousand, 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 two thousand years of no Torah, two thousand years of Torah, then two thousand years of Messiah. I'm just going to write this here. It's the Church Age, okay? And that's been going on for two thousand years since Yeshua left us here, sent the Holy Spirit for us, okay? 
So, what is the church age? It's the Shemayim, the kingdom of heaven, right? The fifth, and the sixth, and, oh, here comes the Aleph Tav right at the end of that, because Yeshua is coming home. Right? He's coming back soon. Are you convinced of it? Yes, okay. And then the last is what we would call the millennial kingdom, the last seven. And that is the Aretz, okay? Well, it's here. It's taking place here, okay? You know that song? We like to sing it. One great morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. And you, you know, I was living on a cloud, playing a harp with a crown. No, there ain't any of it. There's none of it. The kingdom of God is here. coming here. It's coming here and it will be here. Okay? So those 7,000 years line up with those seven words of uh, Genesis 1-1. Kind of cool. Let me, let me do something for y'all, because um, I just think it would be nice. These are the words which Moses gave to Aaron, that Aaron would say these words to the people, that Yahweh's name would be in the people. Yivrech Adonai v'yishmerecha Ya'er Adonai panav ilecha v'yichunecha Yisah Adonai panav ilecha V'yasim lecha shalom Shabbat shalom